<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. We are certainly elated, glad, and happy to have you aboard as we discuss and dissect and hopefully answer any inquisitions about the family. I'm going to be the co uh, presenter today with my dear and best friend, Dr. Cleveland Matthews. I'm Wesley T. Leonard. I am Wesley T. Leonard from Orlando, Florida. Of Dr. Matthews' phone. They know how you're going to ask it to mute your phone. If you can mute your devices until you're ready to uh, participate, it would be highly, highly appreciated. <clears throat> I'm going to deal with the blessings of family and then I'll tag team uh, to Dr. Matthews and he will present um, the burdens of the family. Um, I think we all agree and share uh, light faith and knowledge that families, uh, I see several people coming in, Dr. Matthews, I'm just going to say we are a minute or two early, I think it's uh, 3.38 their time, 4.28 our time. Uh, we want to uh, discuss the importance of family. Uh, by definition, a family is a group of people. Hello. A unit. Hello. <coughs> Again, Dr. Matthews, I think it's right at 3.30, so I see several people coming in. Yeah. Uh, by definition, family is defined as a group of people, a unit of people, uh, usually related by blood, DNA. And often, particularly in the African-American precinct, the family is what we call extended, the cousins and aunts and the grandparents, et cetera. Uh, your ge genealogy of family, uh, your kindred people, your pedigree, those who succeed you, uh, by definition is family. But for us, who are in Christ, uh, we also know the importance of church family. So I'm going to deal with the benefits of family in uh, two different areas, church family, and of course, your biological or your physical family. It's been often noted and absolutely true that you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. Uh, while there are some issues with family, I want to discuss briefly the blessings of the family. God was the ultimate example in my humble view, and I think the Bible would support this thesis, that God gave an example of the importance of family. Our salvation hinges on a family relationship. God, Jehovah, uh, Elohim, and uh, <clears throat> the mighty one Yahweh sent his son to save us. His only begotten son, family. He did not send a carrier, a representative, an ambassador. God sent his only begotten son, his inerrant son to save us. Family is important because God was the ultimate example when something of utmost importance, and I don't think we can find anything more important than salvation, anything of utmost importance, God gave the template that he used his son, a part of his <clears throat> family. When we pray even, the Bible says that the blood of Christ and the spirit of God makes us family. According to Matthew 6 and 9, that model prayer Jesus prayed in his, uh, uh, taught us how to pray in his sermon, 
on the Mount, uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he says, when we pray, we pray our Father. He de depicted the church relationship, disciples, the pupils and followers of Christ. We are all family because we have the same Father. Uh, Genesis 1 also teaches us that uh, when God prepared to make man, he said, let us make man using uh, uh, really betraying he, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So it is important to know the need of family, the examples of family, and now the benefits and the blessings of family, the advantages of family, the assets that being in a family can bring uh, the worth. Uh, what, what does family bring to the table that can boost us, help us, and lift us up? Well, uh, my grandfather used to say, there's two things you don't ever do in your life. You never turn your back on God, and you never turn your back on your family. You and I will need family sooner or later. <clears throat> Be it physical, biological family, or even more profoundly, our spiritual family. I think that's accented in every aspect and component of our life. We all need somebody. Everybody needs somebody. None of us can make it alone. Uh, and I'm not even talking about relationship as a as it relates to romantic or erotic or dating or even marriage, we need somebody. It's just very difficult to try to make it a go alone. Family is about relationship. And again, God is about relationship. Uh, it's when you're in the same tribe. It's when you have somebody you can relate to consult with, console with. It's a benefit to go through a storm, not alone with family. The ecclesiastical writer depicts it in Ecclesiastic 4. We know it to be Solomon. Said two are better than one. For if you fall alone, there's not another to pick you up. So here's a benefit. Brother Matthews and I, Dr. Matthews and I, a family, um, not blood related, no DNA, no deoxyribonucleic acid between us, but he's my little brother. I'm approximately 10 years older than him. We, we're best friend. we family. And what family does, when you have family, you have someone to catch you. Here, here's the benefits we start talking about. Someone to catch you if you fall. That's a strong, good benefit of family. Someone to warm you when you're cold. That's, that's benefit of family. Whether they have to take you in or provide shelter, resources, and you can be cold spiritually or you can be cold physically. So the benefit of family, somebody that, somebody has got your back. Not judgmental, not, not trying to analyze and critique every move you make. Now, I know you got some people in your family to do that, but Dr. Matthews go deal with the burdens of family. I'm dealing with the benefits, ideally speaking. And isn't it amazing? I'm sure a lot of you would concur with Brother Leonard on this. Uh, I got a lot of church family that I'm closer to than my physical family. I can depend on the saints uh, the ecclesia, oftentimes more than I can depend on those who are blood related to me. That's certainly the case when it comes to Dr. Matthews. So ideally, here's the benefit. There's someone to catch you if you fall. Someone, someone to provide, provide warmth for you when you're cold. Someone to defend you when you are attacked. Someone to care for you when you're sick. Someone, someone to borrow from if you're broke. Someone to cheer you up when you're sad. 
uh, I, I would even go as far as a lot of benefits sometimes, but not always what we would depict as beneficial. I will add to that, there's someone to bring you down when you're too high up. And someone to lift you higher when you're too down. Uh, family ought to be able to be honest, brutally honest, and tell us when we're doing things we should not be doing. Give us an honest assessment, critique of where we are. Every critique is not a criticism. Every observation people make about us, and this is the liberty of family. Sister Pam, my wife for 40 years, can tell me stuff that the members won't tell me. That, that's what family will do. It's a benefit. Uh, Dr. Matthews can critique me ministerially, pastorally, when others can't do that. I'm close enough to him, I'm family. We have established a symbiotic relationship. Because remember, family hinges and swings on relationship. Yeah, uh, I, I can be your first cousin, I can, I can even be your sibling. But if we don't have a symbiotic relationship, there's not a benefit to either one of us. <coughs> Blood alone doesn't go far. It's the relationship that makes us family. So now I have somebody in my corner, a part of my unit, a part of my pedigree, a part of my tribe, who is there to support me unequivocally when I need help and somebody to bring me down a peg or two when I'm too high. God went, from, went at things from a family scheme so should you and I. Never dismiss the good that can come out of your family. There's an old adage, and this I prepared a tag team to my, my good friend, Dr. Matthews. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Hear me again. If you want to go fast in life, go by yourself. Go, go alone. But if you want to go far in life, you need family. You need somebody you can relate to, somebody that can help you mentally, emotionally, spiritually, sometimes financially, psychologically. Uh, we, we need somebody to help us. The proliferation of the family has worked almost simultaneously with the demise of our society. When we lost the family unit, particularly in the African-American precinct, the destruction, the demise of the biological family, the husband, wife, mom, pops, and the kids has worked in tandem, in my humble opinion, with the demise, the satanic attack in this sophomore society. And so I will offer today the benefits of family, church family, immeasurable. You and I both know there's storms, deaths, loss, mountains, situations, scenarios we would never get through without church family. You, you know that as well as I know. You can pick a different congregation of people. You can go, you can move from Tennessee to Florida, Florida, California, and find good church folk everywhere that can help you on this magnificent trip from earth to glory. But you cannot, no matter where you move, you can't change your biological family. Yeah, you stuck like Chuck, okay? We all are. But there are benefits in that. I happen to be a middle child, older brother, younger sister. And the older I have gotten, I see the benefits of my siblings. Now that my mom is older, older, my dad is passed on. We need each other to help each other, aid each other, comfort each other, consult with each other, be there for each other. Paul said in the letter to the church at Rome, Romans 8, 35, what shall separate us from the love of God? So I ask you today, what shall separate you from your family? 
Satan's devices, one of them, is divide us and conquer us, tear us apart. His strategy, divide and conquer. Our goal, families stay together. I'm not here to talk about divorce rate. <clears throat> I'm not here to talk about marriage problems. You all know that. <clears throat> Keep living, that will knock at your door. What I am here to talk about is there is an inherent benefit, be it church or be it biological, a family. Pick us up when we fall, warm us when we're cold, defend us when we're in a fight. And that can apply literally or figuratively. Family is there when nobody else is there. You can call family at three in the morning. Church family are biological. And there's a blessing in the family. I think I even feel some amens coming out there. Brother Matthews, I'm going to tag team. Amen. About my... <laughs> time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, whoever that is. Uh, Dr. Matthews, I'm going to tag team to my buddy, my friend, my best friend. My co-author, uh, for those who don't know, he and I have co-authored two books. One about men, our first uh, deposit, the satanic attack against masculinity. We wrote that about five years ago. And then last year released our latest copy, Bad Girls Are in the Church Too. And uh, that deals with women, the value of our sisters, our mothers, our daughters, uh, and church spiritual women. So. We've been collaborating on family issues for a while. Uh, we both are counselors. I'm a family counselor and he is a clinical uh, counselor in many areas. So I'll tag team to my good friend, Dr. Cleveland Matthews. Thank you, my friend. Uh, as, as usual, uh, Brother Wes, uh, does an outstanding job in everything that he does. And it's really an honor and a privilege to be uh, sharing in this uh, historic lectureship with him, um, best friend in the world, and to be sharing it with you. Um, thank God for uh, the opportunity and uh, this technology that allows us to come into this space uh, and carry the message forth uh, in spite of the various limitations that we all are uh, being hampered and encumbered by. Uh, the blessings and the burdens of family, um, Leonard did a very thorough job, very, a uh, very excellent job in uh, giving us a foundation of why family is a blessing. Um, and we, we all benefit from, uh, from the relationships that are vital to us and important to us, whether that is the biological family or the spiritual family or the uh, the particular village or tribe that we have uh, created or become a part of uh, by the grace, the grace of God. And so uh, I'm talking about the, the, the burdens of family. Um, there, there are no perfect uh, families. And I like uh, scripture because scripture gives us a realistic uh, portrait and picture of family, whether it is the first family in the garden who lived in a perfect environment. Um, they, they had no, no financial problems. Um, they um, Initially had uh, no no children. Um, they had no no parents, no aging parents to care for, 
Uh, they had no, no sickness. Um, yet in a perfect environment, their imperfection was manifest and it's continued to be that way ever since. Uh, whether we're talking about Jacob's family with uh, sibling rivalry, or we're talking about Adam's children, when one, uh, when Cain kills Abel, uh, whether we're talking about Lot and his family, uh, his wife who turns back, uh, Lot offering his daughters to uh, the men of Sodom, or we're uh, thinking about the family of Moses, where his sister and his brother Miriam and Aaron rise against him uh, because they don't like the wife that he has chosen. Um, whether we're talking about Jacob's sons um, who have, um, have Joseph thrown into a pit, sold into slavery and lie about it. Um, we're, we're, we're talking about family, family is imperfect well, we're talking about King Saul's family or David's family or even the family of our Lord Jesus Christ. Family is far from perfect. And so with the imperfections, uh, there, there are many burdens uh, that families, uh, families experience. Um, Marjorie uh, Hinckley said that family is where you are loved uh, the most and act the worst. I think that's, that is often very accurate. Uh, family is where we are loved the most and often act uh, the worst. Um, I think it's important as we uh, try to look at this from a modern perspective, that historically, and I don't know who all is on uh, here, it's not my intention to be uh, insensitive or anything of that nature, but when we're talking about African-American families um, in the modern context, um, historically, you know, there, there were major strengths associated with the black family or the African-American family. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hill um, wrote, uh, did a, a classic research uh, in the late 60s, early 70s uh, that has stood the test of time. Um, and his work was on what are the strengths of, of Black families, what are the strengths? What, what unique characteristics and features exist within the fabric of Black folks and their families that can explain uh, our resilience, that could explain our abilities to continue to overcome the adversity and the challenges and the obstacles and the burdens, yes, even the burdens that we encounter. And he came up with, through his research, uh, five, five things uh, that are attributable or were attributable in characteristics of, of the Black family. That included, number one, a strong work orientation, a strong work orientation. The myth that Black folks was lazy has never been true, never will be true. Um, what one of the characteristics uh, that made the Black family strong was um, we had a strong work ethic. We believed in uh, the benefits and the blessings of, of hard work. Number two, uh, he pointed out through his research again that Black families were strong because they had a strong religious orientation. Uh, black folks were worshipers, black folks, um, churchgoers, and uh, brought their children up uh, in, in the way, word, will of the Lord. Um, so the faith and the religious uh, background of black families made the black family strong. Uh, number three, 
uh, a strong uh, a strong belief in family, uh, believing in the importance and the value of of the family was a uh, remarkable attribute of of African Americans historically. Uh, number four, Hill uh, pointed out through again his research that the black family had a very strong achievement focus. Uh, that black folks had a very strong achievement focus, that we were movers and shakers and pushed our offspring, our children to, uh, to be achievers, to do things, to invent things, to make a difference in the world. And then number five, uh, he pointed out through his research that in the, the Black family, uh, one of the, the final thing that made the Black family unique and strong and resilient was uh, adaptability of family roles, adaptability of family roles. And so in the, in the Black family, uh, there was often, um, you know, that there would be connections that necessarily were not, as Brother Leonard pointed out earlier, uh, family connections that were not biological in nature. Um, but we had a way and a history of, of, of taking neighbors in and, and making them family and then becoming a part of family. And so uh, auntie, uh, auntie so-and-so is not a biological aunt, but nevertheless, that's the role that she's played in, in the family. Uh, the importance of the extended family to the nuclear family uh, is a part of that adaptability that exists in, in the black family. And so I brought all of that up uh, as a, a transition uh, from what, um, what Brother Leonard pointed out in terms of the, the blessings of family, whether that's the spiritual family, or the biological family, that there, there's a bridge here. Um, there, there has been uh, burdens and challenges that are not new, uh, but they're being experienced. We are experiencing them in, in different and new ways uh, just because of the way society and the world at, at large has, has changed. And so, um, as far as I can tell in my work with, with human beings, my work with people, whether that was in nursing, uh, whether that's been in pastoral or congregational ministry or brotherhood leadership uh, roles, or uh, now in professional counseling, in working with human beings, um, I've determined that most, most human beings are simply trying to uh, negotiate life. Uh, they're trying to find a way to, um, to make sense out of things, uh, to be able to, to find some place of peace and resolve or meaning or value in, in their existence. And so, uh, the family then is becomes burdened uh, to bring or to, to birth about this this desire and this need in the human being. Uh, the families um, are, are burdened with um, often with past baggage, uh, past trauma. Um, is, is often a burden that families uh, have to deal with. Um, for, uh, for instance, um, the, uh, the past baggage, the past trauma that a family, family members have encountered, they, they take with them as they leave and cleave um, and create 
these these new nuclear families. Um, and so the family continues to grow, the family continues to evolve, but um, some people may call them or refer to them as generational curses. I really refer to them as generational patterns, generational ways of thinking, generational ways of doing that may, uh, may have not been uh, advantageous or godly or spiritual, but for one reason or another, uh, that maladaptive behavior, that maladaptive approach to, to life has created burdens that, um, that now the family has to, to address and deal with. Family is burdened because on the one hand, uh, wealth and power uh, it only rest within a very small, minute number of families in the world. Uh, from, from a scriptural standpoint, wealth was never intended to reside in one or two families. And wealth and power was not intended to dwell in government. Wealth and power were always created by God to rest within the families. So families don't have the power uh, and don't have often the, the financial resources to address the problems of their members. Um, so uh, let's say for instance, a, a family a father and mother had three children. Uh, and let's say one of those children um, is, uh, is autistic. Okay. Now, uh, if, and, and statistics prove this, if you are, the more money you have, the more resources you have, the more power you have, the more in position your family is to provide that autistic child with those needs, with the things that they need, right? Um, now, the poorer you are, the less powerful you are, the less resources you have available to help you in caring for your autistic child, right? Now, let's say that uh, one of the other children um, is bipolar. Right? Uh, you don't know what bipolar is. You didn't know what autism was. All you know is this, this child ain't acting right. They're, they're manic. They're all over the place. They're impulsive. They won't sit down. They can't be quiet. They can't be still. Uh, and then a week of that goes on and then and they, they fall into a deep depression and you can't get them to get out of bed. And you don't know what to do with that. And you don't have the skills, you don't have the resources, you don't have the power. So now you got a child that's bipolar, you got one that's autistic, you got limited resources, all right? And your other child has asthma, severe asthma, all right? Um, and you've had to fight uh, just for health care. Right? So now you, you got these children that, and they all have their own needs. One of them needs to go to rehab. One needs to go to the tutor. Uh, another one needs to go to counseling. Uh, you can't sleep. You can't rest. You're missing days off of work. You're, you're turning in your assignments late, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And things go downhill. That brings stress into the marital relationship uh, and it just balloons from there. What I'm saying in terms of, as we think about the burdens of families, we're really thinking about the burdens of life. What, what we're really talking about is how do I negotiate life? Uh, how do I successfully um, meet the needs uh, and carry my responsibility in terms of, of family to overcome uh, these particular burdens. 
Um, maybe, maybe the burden is substance abuse. Maybe it's alcoholism. And uh, dad, dad's got an alcohol problem, or mom, mom has a problem with alcohol. Now she's not going to stop being mom. She's still mom. And so, what does the family? What the family wants to do is based upon what Brother Leonard was talking about when he says, "All right, if you got two, when you fall down, you got somebody to pick you up. When you're cold, you got somebody to warm you." And so, when we're sick, when we're injured, when we're hurt whether that's the alcoholism, the autism, the asthma, the bipolar, whatever it may be, then we have the, the blessing of family, right? To, to rally around and, and help this individual member of the family become the very best version of themselves possible. And how do we do that? without destroying ourselves or each other in the process. There's a reason why uh, couples who have lost a child uh, have a higher divorce rate. It is because in part, what do I do with this trauma? What do I do with this pain and this hurt? And there's nowhere for it to go because it is outside of the natural order of things, all right? So when we're talking about the burdens of family, we're talking about just life and, and how, how to live and how, how to, to keep our family safe, uh, how to survive and, and to position the members of the family to, uh, to be their very best and to contribute to, to the family. Um, and sometimes we, it's, uh, we live in an individualistic world, and that's been part of the shift that has taken place in the last uh, century and is uh, being even intensified in the current century and the centuries to come. And that is uh, the westernized concept and, and valuation of the individual. That is that what is most important in the Western uh, philosophical and theological mind is not the well-being of society, not the well-being of the family, not the well-being of the clan or the tribe or the village, but it is the, the desires uh, of the individual. So the individual is what is most important. The problem with that, and I'm not suggesting that any of us are any more or less important than anybody else, what I am suggesting is that that, uh, that philosophical and theological construct will not sustain uh, families and will not sustain churches and will not sustain governments um, because it, it creates an environment that we are experiencing today with this cancel culture because any, any individual that is offended all they have to say is, I am offended. That offends me. Right? I am what's most important. Um, I, I, should, I should live in this world and not experience offense. Um, well, that's fine from a political or philosophical standpoint, but it is uh, not consistent with Christian, Christianity or Christian, Christian thought. Um, that the, the, the truth is that we have a responsibility, even if we did not create the problem, even if we did not cause the issue, when we are family, we have a responsibility to assist each other in addressing and resolving problems as they arrive. And, and that too fundamentally is one of the problems that we have uh, in, in terms of being able to successfully deal with our burdens is our inability to solve problems, our inability to assess, um, diagnose, um, look at treatment options and prognosis and, and risk and come up with the best course of action. Right? 
Uh, and then if that doesn't work, to try another course of action, to have a sense of resiliency, a sense of determination. That's how you overcome burdens. Uh, in Galatians chapter six, it says, if, if your brother is overtaken in a fault, right, you who are spiritual, restore such one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And so we have a responsibility. Uh, it's, it's called love. Um, Jesus uh, taught this and illustrated this when he talked about the, uh, the man who fell among thieves, uh, who wounded him and stripped him of his clothes and left him half dead and he talked about how the priest and the Levite just passed by on the other side. They did not help the man. They did not have a burden of responsibility uh, to help this, this man, to inconvenience themselves to help this man. Uh, but then here comes a hated Samaritan, a foreigner, uh, a man who, according to the Jews, doesn't even know God or the proper place or proper way to worship. Yet this man showed love. He, he saw when he, when he looked at the man that was wounded and had to, he couldn't tell if the man he didn't know if the man was Jew, Samaritan, Arabic, he, Roman. He doesn't know the man's clothes have been taken. He sees another human being who is injured and in need of help, and he helps him. Well, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the burdens of a family. We, we, what, we, what we become are burden bearers whereas we help to bear one another's burdens. And so when, when, when mama gets old and grandmama gets old and granddaddy gets old, the, the family, the children and the grandchildren and the siblings rally around to become the caretakers and support of that aged family member, right? Uh, so, Again, when we're talking about this, we're, we're talking about how family plays a part in the, the development of human beings, right? the development of human beings, um, whether that be physical, mental illness that we're talking about, um, you know uh, the the burden of the the burden of negotiating change. Right? One of the things that we often we 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 look at families as being static. We look at marriages and relationships as being static, but they are not. They are dynamic. They are always changing. They are always evolving. And the hardest relationship to maintain is a didactic relationship, a relationship between two people. And that, that's very hard to maintain, be maintained because part of maintaining a didactic relationship is the ability to, um, the ability to tolerate pain for growth. So uh, we, we have a low pain tolerance and because we have a low pain tolerance, we, we, don't work sit we don't sit in our discomfort and our pain to work out our issues with that individual instead we triangle someone or something else into the equation to help stabilize this didactic relationship so in other words husband and wife got tension doesn't matter what the tension is about it's about how they deal with the fact that they got tension in their relationship. So one of the ways that they deal with it is that the wife brings one of the children into the issue. And they start talking to the child about the issue and the tension in the relationship between mother and father. Now, mama feels better because she's been able to unload. Now, the child 
you're probably going to look at the other parent a little differently. It's going to influence that other relationship. And so what we're talking about in, in burdens, everybody, we all know that burdens exist in our families because they exist in us. So the issue is not, you know, how do I prevent the burdens? You can't prevent bur in burdens. I, I heard uh, uh, Leonard's message from, from yesterday, I went on YouTube and listened to his message uh, from, from yesterday, uh, sunshine to glow, rain to grow. You, you've got to have negatives and positives. And in, in us as individuals and in us as families, we have negatives and positives. We have both. So it is not uh, what, it's not always what's wrong, but how are we addressing what's wrong? And I think that's where uh, most of us uh, run into to, to difficulties and get stuck is because we don't know how to negotiate change. Uh, we lack the foundational spiritual principles that are necessary uh, to overcome burdens. Um, Dr. Dr. Matthews, yeah. this is uh, your good friend here. Excellent information. Uh, I'm sure everyone has been blessed and jotting down lists. I think we have about 15 minutes left. Did you want, uh, I think we've been instructed to entertain any questions or inquisitions that may be made by the audience. Uh, would you uh, be willing to do that at this time? Absolutely. Yeah, whether it be the, my portion was the blessings of the family. Of course, Dr. Matthews in that excellent pres presentation talked about the burdens and the responsibilities of the family. So now, if you have a question or something that you would like for us to deal with in our waning moments, certainly be the time we would do that. Uh, so just unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. And then of course, uh, mute, mute as soon as you can, mute back again. Anyone, uh, I, I don't, know the participants, Brother Matthews, so I wish I could call on someone. <laughs> but uh, anyone have a question? If not, then we'll just both kind of give a, a closing synopsis of what we're trying to disseminate <clears throat> on this afternoon. But we certainly want to engage you uh, if you had any questions or inquiries on the blessings and the burden of family. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I'm Dolores Myers, um, and I have just a comment to make. Um, both of your, um, your information was wonderful. And I, I, think, um, I think many of us in America, African-Americans, and maybe even especially in the church, we don't know, we really don't know, like we know what happened to us, but we really don't understand what it did to us and what it did to the family and just all the things that came with, um, you know, what happened in America to African-Americans and um, several things were brought out. Even the session earlier that I listened to, um, um, just, just, just know. So I, I think we really need to understand and learn and know our history and know more than just we, we were enslaved. But, but there were a lot of things that came with that that affect us even to this day in the church. So I appreciate, I just appreciate what you brought out and, and all the, the information that you share because it really helped me um, to see some things within myself and with, with my family and just how we deal with, with each other. And it's just, there's a lot I could say, but I appreciate it. Thank yes. you. We, we, we're, we're highly appreciative, Sister Dolores. Uh, again, as I mentioned in our tag team again with Dr. Matthews, the proliferation of the African-American family has its roots, as you mentioned, in slavery, the domino effect, the collateral damages. Just very briefly to give you an example. Uh, but now you do know we are assimilating now. 
with it. There's a, from our worship, you brought up our worship, that there's this strong need to assimilate to the majority culture. There are benefits in that, but also there's destruction in that. Uh, when you find others, you tend to lose yourself. Um, our discipline and reservation, and those of you who are older in this audience uh, on this, or who are listening know this to be true. The discipline we had, the hard discipline, mama, big mama, my dear, Aunt Jane, uh, you know, they, they all would be in jail today. Y'all know what I mean. <laughs> they, they would be on death row if they were doing today what they did when we were coming along, <clears throat> verbally and physically. That's born of slavery. There's so much. See, the, the parent, the African-American parent that had to have hard discipline on their children. Because yes. if, you, if you disobey master, you find a rope around your neck. So they didn't let the child disobey anybody. You don't talk back. You know, we, my mama, grandmama, they didn't let us talk back. That's born a slave. There was no engagement. You don't ask a question. There's no democracy. They didn't care what you thought. Because if you ever had the freedom to express yourself at home, you might do it abroad. And if you do it abroad, it might meet you a bitter end. It's a subtle thing, but it's passed on generationally to uh, sl slavery is one of those things. And there are many, many more, uh, Dr. Matthews and I, uh, we're both licensed counselors. And so those who may need to get with us, uh, you can get with us in private. There's so many things from our wish about it. I wouldn't even want to go down that road. But it, it's so many things we inherited and uh, uh, was forced upon us that still plague us, even on today. Dr. Matthews, feel free to. Uh... Oh, no, it's, it's very good. Very good. Dr. Matthews? I have a question and I don't know if I have a complete understanding of, of a statement that you made, but I want to go back to the family where we had autism and we had, bio, you know, um, asthma and somebody who was uh, bipolar. Um, and you, I thought you made um, the statement that we don't have resources to address the problems. Now, was that basically in the family? Because I'm thinking in, and I'm trying to, 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 to weave in here your statement about government and I understand and, and I appreciated um, the focus on, on, on God, what God had designed for the family. But for me, I think that today, there we are better informed we we can rely on um government to to step in especially when you're in a public school setting to help these children who have um special needs and 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 i see that perhaps as um an asset and and perhaps i misunderstood uh what you were basically saying about not having these resources or being unable to address the problems within the family. Can you clarify that for me? Oh, yes, yes. And I really appreciate your, um, your, your comments and, and question. Um, to, here's, here's what I was attempting to communicate. The the better off a family is financially, the better access they have to resources. Okay, okay. That's what I was trying to communicate. Okay, I, and, and, and I, I thank you for that because one of the, one of the things that I see and I see, I see public education as a form of government and through those through that particular uh, venue or vehicle, I know that that youngsters who are in public education and who have those special needs, they do have, um, or parents have access. And I simply feel that as African-Americans, even we, 
with children who have special needs are better informed today than our parents' generation and certainly our grandparents. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, we're, I work, I do, I work in the community. So I, I work with uh, kids who have ADHD, uh, autism, uh, a lot of substance abuse, um, and in almost every case that I'm dealing with, is there's a lack of there. There's poverty. There's poverty, whether that's black or white or Hispanic. The people I'm dealing with are impoverished, and they just don't. They don't have the the knowledge. The resources are there, but they don't have the knowledge to uh, to know where to go to get those that assistance, and they don't have the skills. But thank you so much. I I, I really get where you're coming from and wish we had more time to get into that. Yeah. Thank to thank, thank you, Sister Barbara, for your question. Brother Matthews, I always capsulate that by saying when I Leonardize it, it is in America, it's better to be rich and guilty than poor and innocent. And so, uh, uh, and that's absolutely true. So it, yeah. for me, in our medical system, our judicial system, our educational system, every aspect and component of Americana, uh, the more fluent you are, the more resources you tend to have at your fingertips. And I appreciate that. We want to entertain maybe a couple more questions, uh, you know, before time is completely exhausted. So if you're here and you want to chime in, thank you again, Sister Barbara Lockhart for that question. Anyone else like to chime in at this time? Yes, Brother Leonard, this is Jackie uh, Shelton Wallace. And I just wanted to comment on or add to Sister Lockhart's comment in that while today we do have access to uh, services in the school systems, you still are handicapped if you're not in an environment where you make more money and live in a more affluent area than if you live in the inner city. I was fortunate enough to live in an affluent area. I had relatives that lived in inner city. They had access to special uh, needs services, but the schools still didn't give it to them unless you know exactly what's available to you to push that envelope to get it. Whereas in a more affluent school system, they're more apt to give it to you uh, as part of the standard quo, status quo of their school system. So I understand that we may have more access to the services, but you can't access what you don't know. And um, we still are dealing with environments where parents are not engaged in the school system and they don't know. That's my comment, thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Wallace. Again, I think what Dr. Matt, one of the powerful points he made, and I certainly concur. See, the benefit of family is that, and particularly the it takes a village, the extended family is even when mom and pop or your immediate family are not keenly aware of things, the extended family, the church family, many African Americans have been influenced by a coach, a teacher, a Sunday school teacher a neighbor, a family friend, a play play auntie as, as Dr. Matthew meant. See, the benefit of family is when you don't know something, you don't have access to something, but someone in your concentric circle does know or can tap into those resources. That's one of the benefits of having an extended family, again, be it biological or spiritual, because you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, sometimes it's a lack of knowledge, and sometimes it's beyond this, it's apathy uh, amongst people. And so it, it just helps the more people you have in your circle who can advise and counsel, aid and assist. And that's what family is supposed to be for. And that's why it needs to be extended. Dr. Matthews. Good afternoon. Um, I am a, a retired uh, licensed clinical social worker and uh, I ran the committee in my schools, uh, whereas uh, the uh, chairperson to um, 
um, student uh, assistance team to provide services for the students uh, who had special needs. Uh, one of the problems that I encountered in addition to what you all have said is uh, denial. Uh, the family members were wanting to stay in a state of denial uh, based on, as I heard the segment earlier, the stigma associated with uh, labeling. They would say, I don't want my child labeled. And uh, so we were try to work with them to finally would eventually get to the point where they had no choice because of the exhibiting behavior of the child or the failure of them with their academics and our suspensions, et cetera, if they had like ADHD and some aggressive behavior. But uh, I just wanted to share that that was one of the issues uh, I encountered um, as I served uh, on that committee as chair chairperson. But my goal was certainly to advocate I make sure that my parents were informed and every possible service that was available, I would advocate for them. Yes, excellent. We certainly appreciate your work and what you're doing. There's so many nuances, as one sister mentioned, from slavery to our culture. It's not the Matthews mentioned our council culture. There's so many things that influence us, shape us, and mold us. Uh, sometimes to our benefit, but a lot of times to our detriment. So uh, this ADHD uh, stuff, I, when I was growing up, there was no such thing. Yeah. Nobody could clinically diagnose you, a child or even an adult with depression. There, there's just there's no medication, really no diagnosis. Uh, you just had to get your act together. And when you didn't, you didn't succeed. And and so the progress, I think, what Dr. Matthews is making, uh, stating, there's a lot of progress being made. I think Sister Wallace made this too. But some are being left behind in the family. So our responsibility as family is to help those, educate those, inform those who are being left behind in the shadows, uh, who could benefit from what we know, what we've experienced, and what we've been educated uh, to learn our job, our burden, as my friend so accurately stated, then it's a burden now. Uh, Jesus said, to whom much is given, then much is expected. So the more, the more you know, now you, you do know when you try to help some people, they're resistant to help, okay? Uh, they're already down that crazy road and here you trying to rescue them. And if you are not careful, you'll be crazy. Okay, so what you have to do then is understand your burden is to try in a civil, spiritual way to help people. And then also always remember that sometimes we need to be helped. So, you know, I, he'll tell you this as ministers, brothers, evangelists, pastors, uh, whatever role you want to tag on us, counselors, we spend all of our time helping people. But what we have a covenant relationship, but then we help each other. Every preacher needs a preacher. Every counselor needs a counsel, counselor. So we, we do that for each other. I encourage all of you to do that uh, with each other. Besides the corporate worship and the church activity and the, the gathering, the ecclesia, uh, we have to be there for each other, become these families, these uh, everywhere that we uh, can help assist, aid, one another on this tedious Christian journey. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure how much more time we have about Matthews, but I'll let you kind of chime in and maybe close out. Oh, those excellent comments. A um, lot of good feedback over here in the chat room as well. Again, thank you all for this privilege, uh, allowing us to speak into your, um, into your hearts today. Uh, we know that it's um, it's a limited time, but uh, it certainly is a worthwhile time. And uh, again, uh, thanks to uh, you and Sister Camille and uh, all of those who work behind the scenes with this great lectureship. It's been a privilege and a joy. I uh, hope to meet some of you in person at some time, if God will uh, allow. Always great to be with my, my best friend, uh, Wesley T. 
Thank you all for attending our session and be blessed throughout the remainder of the- Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. And may God keep all of you and hopefully he and I will be in a city near you soon. Bless you all. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank very you. Good. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Yes. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Okay.